Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. To be sure that you never miss an episode of the podcast, I encourage you to follow it using your favorite podcast software. And as you're making your travel plans, remember to check johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is our Priceline affiliate link. So if you make a reservation for a hotel, rental car, or airline ticket, part of the purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, now it's time for our next episodes of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air dates, October the 5th through October the 7th, 1955, and it's the McCormick Matter Parts 3 through 5. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is Dules Martin. Lieutenant Martin? Yeah, that's right. I got a message you called while I was out and left this number. Yeah. I want to talk to you about the McCormick case, Lieutenant. McCormick? $100,000 burglary out on Long Island back in 1951. Uh, I was the officer in charge. Who are you? Insurance investigator. I got a tip that an ex-convict named Joe Panny might have pulled it. I'm at Panny's hotel. Well, let me know how you make out. Say, listen. His room's been torn apart. Every inch of it's been searched. And when I came here tonight, I got socked by a woman with a gun. Give me that address. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Expense account, item seven, two dollars, two drinks. For myself and Lieutenant Dules Martin, NYPD. A big swarthy man who seemed to know what he was about. Martin looked over the damage done by the unknown ransacker of Joe Panny's room questioned the clerk who was unable to furnish any helpful information. Then, because Joe Panny was officially a parole violator, ordered a general pickup. Hey, should be able to get our hands on him pretty soon, Dollar. I hope it's that easy, Lieutenant. Any reason why it shouldn't be fairly routine? No, just a feeling, I guess. I don't know. This whole matter has been flimsy. The tip was weak, but it seems to be paying off. Nothing fits, though. I don't quite get all this, Dollar. How'd you come in on this? Old Mike Cairn died up at Sing Sing two days ago. Before he went, he told me he believed Joe Panny might have pulled a McCormick burglary. It didn't seem likely then, Panny being a small-time auto thief and whatnot. But now it does, in view of what's been happening lately. Somebody sure wants something Panny might have, judging from that room. I never saw one taken apart better, an expert search job. Yeah. Hey, Lieutenant, when you pick Joe Panny up, I'd like to be in on it. He's my only lead in this case, and I want to talk to him again. And it's not asking too much? Now, Dollar, about this woman you saw. Pretty, about 30, dark hair, good dresser, wore a silver mink stole. The gun she socked me with was a little one, a 25 or maybe 32 automatic. Mm Mm-hmm. You think she might have done the searching in Joe's room? What do you think? She was flustered and upset when I bumped into her, anxious to get away from the place. And, of course, the gun in her hand. Yeah. She sound familiar to you in this neighborhood? No, no. Could be anybody. Yeah. Well, that's about it, Lieutenant. Yeah. No, I got it. Oh, thanks. I suppose you talked to McCormick, got the full story of the burglary from him? Almost first thing, yeah. Well, I remember him when it first happened. Nice enough, but strange, I thought. This business about somebody phoning the parole office ahead of you to get Joe Panny's address that stops me, though. Well, that's hard to figure. You sure you're telling me everything? Sure, I'm sure. That part sounds crazy. Not if somebody knew I was looking for him, wanted to get him first. Yeah, but who? How should I know? Well, we'll see what we will see. Uh, can I drop you anywhere? No, thanks. I'll walk. You let me know when you pick him up. Sure. Sure. 
Two days passed, and I didn't hear from Lieutenant Martin. I finally phoned in, and a supplementary had turned up no leads. Martin had men watching Joe's hotel. His former friends and acquaintances were being checked. Meanwhile, I decided to try and find out who the dark woman in the first stole had been. It seemed pretty obvious that she had just come from Joe's room, that she knew him or was connected with him in some way. So once more, I combed over Joe Panny's file at headquarters, this time looking for a woman's name. The only one mentioned was an ex-wife who had divorced him six years before. Her name was Iris Carter. At the Bureau of Vital Statistics, the marriage certificate and record of divorce proceedings gave me a composite picture of an unhappy and turbulent three-year marriage. It also gave me a general description of Iris Carter that could very well fit the woman I'd seen briefly in the hallway outside Joe Panny's hotel room. There was a six-year-old address to start on. No, ma'am, I'm not Eunice. Oh, no, you sure ain't. You seen her? I don't know. I really don't know her. Oh. Well, what do you want? I'd like to talk to the manager. I want some information. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. What kind of information are you looking for? Are you the manager? Yes, sir, I am. Well, I'm trying to locate a woman named Iris Carter. She might have used the name Iris Panny. She was married once to a man named Joe Panny. Lived here about six years ago. Were you here then? I was. Did you know her? I did. Did you know him? Yeah. He went to jail. Does she live here now? She don't. Do you have any idea where I can find her? I don't. Well, uh, do you happen to know if she ever Why worked do you want or... her? Just to talk to her. When did she move out? Oh, long time ago. Five years, maybe. Uh-huh. What's your business? Insurance. Oh, <laughs> What's up? Oh, nobody around here buys insurance. <laughs> well, we don't have to go into that. If you can think of any place I might get a line on her, I'd appreciate it. It seems to me she worked at a bookstore down the street. Down what street? Out there. Block or two down that way. I think she worked there. I don't know. You can try. Thank you. I will. My, you polite. You tip your hat. So tell me, do you remember what she looked like? Sort of, yeah. Well? Oh, about as tall as I am. Nice, pretty girl. Blonde or brunette? Dark hair, almost black. Know any of her friends when she lived here? Mm, No. No, I couldn't tell you that. Why? Oh, I might look up one of them and ask her about her, that's all. You ask at that bookstore. I think she worked there. The bookstore Iris Carter Panny had worked in was as dismal as the neighborhood. The proprietor, a Mrs. Olds, yielded a little more helpful information than Iris Carter's former landlady. Yes, Iris had worked there for about six months. She'd quit almost five years before. No, she didn't know where to find her. Expense account, item eight, one dollar and two cents, lunch. I had it in a neighborhood diner called the Showboat place where Mrs. Olds said Iris Carter had frequently eaten. The restaurant manager remembered Iris vaguely. She also remembered Iris's boyfriend. I asked for a description. She did better than that. She gave me his name, occupation, and address. An old rehearsal hall two blocks away. five-man combo working there was really putting it out. Yeah, and the minute I saw him, I knew the boy wearing the trumpet was the one I was looking for. Just good-looking and smooth enough to go with a girl Iris Carter sounded like. Smooth trumpet, too. Okay, guys, take five. I'm looking for Jack Lang. You found him. I'm Johnny Dollar. Could we talk a minute? That's about all I got, Mr. Dollar. Want to smoke? No, thanks. Oh, man. It gets real tired out about this time of day. Yeah, imagine it does. The way you put it out. Well, everybody to his own racket. <laughs> What's yours? Insurance investigating. Okay. Now what? 
Well, I've been asking around the neighborhood, and they tell me you once knew a girl named Iris Carter or Iris Panny. Iris Carter. Go on. I'd like to find her and talk to her, and I thought you might be able to help me. Go on. I want to talk to her ex-husband most of all. I thought somehow she might know where to find him these days. He's in the can. He was released three weeks ago. No. Any ideas? No. I thought finding her might be a shortcut to him. I wouldn't think so. They were all washed up when I knew her. When was that? Five years ago. She hadn't seen him for over a year then. Uh Uh-huh. She didn't have much use for him. I don't blame her. How long did you know her? No. We went together for a while while she worked at some crummy bookstore. Then she moved away, and I didn't see her after that. I think she said something about going back to Ohio. You think? I don't remember offhand. Well, let me put it this way. As far as I know, she's in no trouble. The one we want is her ex-husband. You'd be helping a lot if you could tell me where to find her. I don't know. I honestly don't know, and I sure wish I did. I'd like to find her myself. Why? Well, when she went with me, I... Well, wasn't any good. I think she just walked out because she was tired of losers. Sick up to here, you know what I mean? Can't blame her. He gave her a pretty bad time. I didn't do much better. But now I got something. It's this little five-piece outfit. Not much, but something. I'd like to show it to her and say, Iris, this is mine. You kind of had it bad, huh? Bad as a guy like me can get it. I know I'll probably never see her again as long as I live, but... Boy, if never another one like her ever shows up, I'm going to be ready, Dad. Ever see her? No, she must have been something. Here. Yeah. <sighs> Take a look. Nice, huh? Yeah. I take it back. What back? About seeing her. I've seen her. When? Where? Two nights ago in the hallway outside Joe Panny's room. You you sure? I'm sure. She hit me with a gun before she left. The picture he had flipped out of his wallet was old and well-thumbed. It showed a sultry kind of face that could have been 20 or 30 or 40. A wide, frank, smiling, happy mouth. Not the kind of girl I would imagine could ever be married to a Joe Penny. But there was no doubt about it. She had been married to him, and I had seen her. On my way back to the hotel, I dropped in to check with Lieutenant Martin. Hi. Hi. Doing any good? Any lead on Joe Penny? Nothing so far. This may take longer than I thought at first. Well, I've been out looking for his ex-wife. I didn't find her, but I found a few people who knew her. She was the one at his hotel the other night. Name's Iris Carter. You sure? Positive. I saw her picture. We better try to pick her up, too. I'll put it out right away. Fine. Well, I'll keep in touch. Oh, wait a minute. Don't go. Huh? We had some action here today. Sit down. Thanks. Julian McCormick called up, reported you. He said you came out there bothering him a couple days ago. He said he doesn't want to be bothered. Well, I only talked to him to get his story on the burglary. And I told him as long as you didn't break the law, there was nothing we could do to stop you from investigating. But he didn't like it. He seemed perfectly willing to cooperate with me when I talked to him before. Yeah, well, sometime these rich... Excuse me. Martin here. That's right. Well, how long ago? Okay. Well, they found your boy, Joe Penny. What? Yeah. He's on his way to the morgue. Harbor Patrol picked up his body a couple of hours ago, loaded down with slugs. Some case. And that ain't all, Johnny. Huh? His feet were burnt. Johnny Deller. Frank Porter at Allied Casualty. How's it going, kid? I don't know. You ever find Joe Penny? The Harbor Patrol found him floating around the harbor. He'd been shot and his feet were burnt. What? Gee whiz, torture. Well, what can I do to help? Find a girl who was once married to him. Joe Penny had a wife? Yeah, she wears a mink stole these days and carries a gun. She's tied up with it somewhere. Her name's Iris Carter. Iris Carter? You've met her? Just long enough to get slugged with her gun. Well, wait a minute. I'd like to get it all straight. Can I come over? I'll be here. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Expense account, item 9, $14 even, secretarial services. I dictated a detailed report of the $100,000 McCormick case. I did it for two reasons. One, to make certain that Allied and the New York police were thoroughly informed of my part of the matter. And two, to review the case for my own benefit. One of the key figures, Joe Panny, was a murder victim. Attached is a copy of that report. I tried to cover as closely as possible my conversation with Mike Cairn at Sing Sing when he tipped me off that Joe Panny had something to do with the McCormick burglary of five years ago. Also, one conversation with Joe Panny, his subsequent disappearance and murder. I had a copy for Frank Porter when he showed up at my room. He read it from top to bottom. Gee whiz, Johnny, if this isn't something. You come here for Joe Panny, looks like he did the McCormick job, now he's dead. You're stopped. What can you do? Find his wife, maybe? You're doing this at your own expense, aren't you? Oh, I think your company will pay for it in time. You have to recover the stuff. I know. You think you will? I think so, yeah. Well, your key man's dead. You have to start all over again. Maybe not. I don't really know whether Joe Panny was my key man or not. I still can't see a small-time auto thief working a big, slick safe burglary. Every indication is that he was the one. I know. I'd like to find that girl, Iris Carter, and talk to her about it. She's connected with it. No, from what you say on the paper, yeah, very much. Oh, gee whiz, I feel like a fifth wheel. I'm not helping you a bit. You know, I handled this case for the company when it first broke. I worked with Lieutenant Martin for six months on it, and we didn't turn up a thing. You're on it three or four days, and you have all kinds of action. Well, I must have stepped in at the right time. Yeah. Johnny, mm -hmm. somebody gunned Joe Panny down. Now, I know you like to work alone and do things your own way, but... Be careful if you stay on this. I get worried when somebody starts shooting. Oh, sure. I didn't get that, though. Why? If I keep on this, I wouldn't let it go now if my life depended on it. I'm going to find that woman, and I'm going to find the stuff. Sure. Well, gee whiz. Don't let anything happen to you. I won't. I talked some more with Frank Porter about the case. He repeated his offer in the name of Allied Casualty to help if he could. I told him I'd take it up on it if anything came up at all. He left. I was at Central Police Station ten minutes later. And five minutes after that, Lieutenant Dules Martin was calling for the medical examiner's report on Joe Panny's death. A uniformed man brought it in. Martin shoved it across the desk at me. The M.E. says Joe Panny's been dead about 48 hours or longer. 225 slugs right through the chest, penetrated both lungs, one through the neck. It's a very neat shooting at that range. What range? Oh, at least 20 feet, maybe longer. Not many people shoot 25s that well. It's a little gun. A woman's gun. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Now, let's talk about that woman you saw around there that night. Now, you say it was Panny's ex. Yeah. Iris Carter. I don't know whether her gun was a 25 or 32. Well, think about I it. I have. Now, look, don't get sore with me. It's just that she looks like better than ever for opening this case up. I put her on in all points. Sorry I got around. That's all right. Now, the M.E. thinks that Panny was killed before he was dumped in the water, possibly ambushed by someone he didn't know or didn't trust. If he's right about the range, that'd fit in. Someone who knew him would do it close up. Yeah. Hey, wait. You said his feet were burnt. Yeah, I got the pictures here to prove it. Yeah, take a look. These are the glossies. Uh-huh. Now, these are the burns here, Dollar. Right here. Here and here. Yeah. Then he wasn't ambushed exactly. Look, I don't know what he was. But this is the crazy part. He was already dead when this happened. No rope marks on his legs or wrists. You don't sit still for burning, no matter how tough you are. It's fascinating, huh? Someone shot him down, then tried to make it look like he was tortured for information first. Cover up. He's supposed to look like he knew something, or had something. And maybe he didn't know or have anything at all. Oh, well, how do you feel? Lousy. If the burning was cover-up, then maybe the big search of his room was cover-up, too, to throw us off. Uh, uh, to throw you off. Not me. I wasn't in on it then. Yeah. Well, one thing that's genuine. What's that? The corpse. <laughs> I 
An hour and a half later, a witness was delivered to the office of Lieutenant Martin. His name was Edmund Thompson. He sold papers in the dock area. Both Martin and I looked at him twice, and I could tell both of us were doubting the credulity of anything he might have to say. Hi. Hi. My name's Martin. This is Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. Glad to know you both. Uh, would you mind telling us everything you saw the other night? Tuesday night. Yeah, it was Tuesday. Sure, why not? I saw this guy dumped in the water. We understand that. Can you tell us the circumstances? It's against the will of God. Yes, it certainly is. Against the laws of nature, too. What did you see, Mr. Thompson? I prayed for them both. You tried, Dollar? When did you pray? Right after I saw it. Yes, sir. On the street, huh? No. I was on the vacant lot. I was cutting across towards the dock. Oh. Then I see this car pull up. Long black car. A lot of chrome on it. This fella jumps out and goes around at the back. He opens the trunk. And he pulls this other fella out. Hoists him up and he carries him over the dock. Then he just lets him go. Then you prayed. Then I prayed. I was a little too scared to do anything else. Uh, this car the man had. Long black one, a lot of chrome. Sedan or coupe? What's the difference? Two seats or one seat? One seat. Happen to get the license number? Uh. All right, all right, let that go. How about the man? Can you describe him? He stood there, looked down at the water, and started himself a cigarette. Well, what kind of a face did he have? Dark, light, a mustache, what? A devil's face. Oh, swell. Now, what does that mean? A devil? Mr. Thompson, do you understand that we want to apprehend this man, that he's responsible for one man's death, and that he might harm someone else? I'll pray for him. Pray for him all. Well, how was he dressed? Didn't notice. Hat? Don't know. Coat? Don't know. But he had a long black coupe. Do you know the make? Nope. Would you know him if you saw him again? Nope. Look, when you saw him dump a body into the water, why didn't you notify the police? Why should I? It's police business. Let them take care of their business. I'll take care of mine. Any of you fellas got a cigarette on you? I left Lieutenant Martin brooding over his witness and went out for a bite of dinner. When I called him later, he hadn't learned anything more, so I decided to call it a night and went back to my hotel. I found a note waiting for me from Jack Lang, the band leader friend of Iris Carter. Said he'd got a tip. She'd worked at one time at the Elmar Theater in the Bronx. If I learned anything, please let him know. He was still in love with her. Elmar Theater. I decided my night was far from over. Hey, you. Buy a ticket out front if you want to look at the girl. I only want to see one. Her name's Iris Carter. Does she work here? I just told you, go buy a ticket out front. Just tell me this. Does Iris Carter work here? Is the name familiar to you? Have you ever seen her or heard of her? You give me any more trouble, I'll clutch. I told you, go off front. Can't you answer a simple question? I'm looking for Iris Carter. Iris Carter. You don't have to yell at mister. He never heard of it. What? Call me a cop, Gloria. Never this mind, guy's cop. giving never me... Never mind, I'll take care of him. Come on, you. Iris Carter, is that what you said? Yeah. I got to change. I got to get back on in five minutes. Then I'll talk to you later. You haven't got much to say. Stick around. I'll change back the screen. Okay. I'm Gloria Ward. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. What do you want with Iris Carter? I want to see her and tell her something. Tell me. Well, for one thing, her ex-husband's dead. What? Oh, better watch that screen. Oh, oh. Say that again. Joe Panny, her ex-husband's dead. No kidding. That no good bum is really dead. Yeah. Where can I find her? She don't work here no more. Hasn't worked here in four or five years. She quit. Well, where is she? You took over from the old man out there when you heard me mention her name. You've satisfied yourself that I'm really looking for her, so suppose don't you... do flip with me, mister. I'm not satisfied about anything. <clears throat> where is she? She got herself married to a nice guy. Good for her. Is she in town? 
sure you just want to see her and tell her Joe's dead? That's about it. I thought maybe she might be able to help me and the police find out who killed him. He was killed? Two days ago. They found his body today. How do you know about that? Are you a cop? I'm an insurance investigator. And you have to see her? You want it put in writing? Don't get in a huff. What I'm getting at is this. Quick change, huh? Now listen. Iris is good. You know what I mean? And she's married to a nice guy now. Will any of this make her trouble? Not if she hasn't done anything wrong. Well, I can tell you she hasn't. If it does make trouble, it'd be a shame. She set up nice, and I like to see a girl set well, don't you? Certainly. Well, I haven't seen her almost since she left here, but... Well, you look like a right kind of guy. I believe you. Thanks, Gloria. She lives out in Long Island now. Her name's McCormick. Iris McCormick. <laughs> By the time I said goodbye to Gloria and walked out the stage door and got out into the alley, I thought I had most of it figured. The ex-wife of an ex-con married a wealthy Long Islander named McCormick. When the honeymoon was over, the safe was robbed. Walking out that alley, I was wondering whether to phone the police or allied casualty first. Been hit. Oh, it isn't bad. Did you see him? I didn't see nobody. The car. See the car. The one that just gunned out. Oh, the car. We had a long black coupe, a lot of chrome. A fellow didn't have his lights on. Hey, that's against the law. Hey, you need help, mister. No. No, I'm all right. Johnny Dollar. Ready with your party in Hartford, Connecticut, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Barth. Yes? This is Johnny Dollar. Johnny, what's up? Now, listen carefully, Ed. I've just been shot. What? Oh, it's nothing serious. I'm backstage at the Elmar Theater in the Bronx. Johnny... I'm all right. Now, listen to me. I got a tip from old Mike Cairn, a convict, that a man named Joe Panny might have had something to do with the McCormick case a few years ago. Yes, a jewelry case, $100,000. Well, Panny's been murdered. I didn't get a chance to learn anything from him... But I have learned that Panny's ex-wife is married to Julian McCormick. You've uh, contacted our New York office? I've been trying to get your man Frank Porter at his home, but no one answers. It's going to be pretty nasty for Allied Casualty if she plotted with this Joe Panny to rob McCormick. Yeah. Do you want me to wait and let Frank Porter handle it? Uh, No, no, no. You go ahead. If somebody's throwing bullets around, they'd better be stopped before... Oh, well... By me rather than Frank Porter, huh? Okay. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Mm-hmm. Item 11, seven dollars and a half, one bottle of scotch, which I sent the stage doorman out to get while I was calling Ed Barth at Allied Insurance. Apparently everybody in the neighborhood thought the exchange of shots between me and somebody in a long black coupe were backfires. It was the doorman who dragged me back in the theater. Uh, you got yourself a boy now, mister. Ah, uh, it's just a graze. Well, I sure don't get you. Call an insurance people and not police. Somebody fires a gun, don't you call the cops? Have another drink. That's the way it seems to... Hey, hey, where you going? You should see a doctor. Later. I went back outside in the alley where the shooting had taken place. Ten minutes of looking around and I dug a pair of 38 slugs out of a telephone post. Expense account, item 12, $4.35, cab fare, Elmar Theater to Long Island. It was 12 o'clock straight up when I got to the McCormick home. There were no lights burning, and apparently everyone had retired for the night. I checked the garage first, a 55 Cadillac convertible and a four-year-old Jag. No warm motors, no black coupes. I went to the house. Oh, It's you. Hello, Mrs. McCormick. No, no, please. Please don't come in here. My husband... Oh, please. 
I don't know who you are, but I remember meeting you at the hotel the other I'm day. I'm Johnny Dollar, an insurance investigator. Insurance? Oh, well, there must be some way we can fix this up. Talk to me tomorrow. I'll meet you somewhere. How can you fix up murder? Murder? What are you talking about? Joe Panny's dead. Your ex-husband. He was shot with a twenty-five, Just like the one you swung at me at the hotel. Oh, no. <laughs> you want to tell me about that? All right, I'll tell you. Joe was your husband once. You helped him rob this house five years ago. He couldn't have done it alone. He wasn't that slick. He wasn't that good. He could steal a car, but a safe lock's different from ignition. Well? Yes. Yes, I helped him do it. He made me. He promised me if I helped him, I'd never hear from him again. I opened the safe for him. But you were down to see him at his hotel the other night. You searched his room. Searched his room? Yeah. Well, I don't know anything about that. He called me, said he wanted money. I didn't know where he'd been for these last few years. Up the river. Oh, well, he wanted money. Only he wasn't there when I went there. And I was. Yes. And the gun? I went down there to kill him. But I didn't see him. Not then. Later somewhere. I haven't seen him at all, I tell you. Just talked to him on the phone. I I don't suppose it would make any difference if I told you I had a good reason. If I told you I love my husband very much. Not likely, in view of the fact you helped your ex-husband rob him of $100,000 worth of jewelry five years ago. Oh, I can explain that. Joe came around when we got back from our honeymoon. It's an old story. My past isn't all it... Well, anyhow... Joe threatened to tell my husband about it, unless I gave him money. I didn't have any, so I opened the safe for him that night. It was all I could think to do. Yeah. Then you split with him later on. I told you, I haven't seen him. Why would I want to do that? I have everything I want in life, right here. Mostly my husband. Well, it's still a police matter, Mrs. McCormick. I spent a long time looking for you. Maybe you better get your coat. Iris. Oh, you remain exactly where you are. Julian. And so will you, Mr. Dollar. Julian, you heard what I said. Don't worry about it, my dear. Mr. Dollar, I'm a gentleman. But this is a gun. I noticed. A thirty-eight. I got a couple of slugs in my pocket that came from it. Stand over there. Now, this is pretty silly. You can put that thing away and we can settle this my the only way it can be settled. I told you the absolute truth, Mr. Dollar. She's innocent of any wrongdoing so far as I'm concerned. Is that clear? It's pretty glib, McCormick. She's accessory to a $100,000 heist, and she hasn't done anything wrong. If she wanted to give them away... To an ex-husband. To anybody. That was her affair. I would not press charges. Well, that takes care of you. How are you going to square it with allied casualty in the state of New York? And you also forget a little matter of a dead man. But I haven't forgotten you, Mr. Dollar. Julian, please don't. I've caused enough trouble, please. Calm yourself, my dear. This is the least I can do for you after what you've done for me. Just being my wife. Mr. Dollar, will you accept money? Not enough for murder. Fifty, uh, hundred thousand? I'd hate to kill you, Mr. Dollar. You tried once tonight. You've referred to that before. But you weren't very good, and now you're even worse. You forgot to take the safety off that gun. Your safety! Oh, no! No! Oh, you killed him! You killed him! Ah, he's all right. Get out of the way and let me see that gun. <laughs> I wasn't interested in either one of them for the moment. I was looking at the 38 I'd taken from Julian McCormick. There was a smear of cosmoline still inside the barrel. I sniffed it, checked it, found all chambers loaded. It was a brand new weapon, and it had never been fired. Expense account item 13, five dollars and a half, cab fare again, this time from Long Island to an apartment in Queens. The man I wanted to see was Allied Casualties man Frank Porter. He lived in a very polite neighborhood. Uh, that's apartment 203, but Mr. Porter is not in, sir. I'll wait for him. Yes, sir. It's all right if I sit in your lobby, isn't it? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But uh, I'd prefer that you waited somewhere else. You would? Well, this is a rather exclusive apartment building, sir, and we don't like people uh, loitering in the lobby. Well, I'm on a pretty exclusive mission. But uh, you don't like the mud on my clothes and the tear on my coat, huh? Are you a friend of Mr. Porter's? Yeah. Good friend? He wouldn't mind if I waited in his apartment, if that's what you mean. No, sir. Impossible. But a couple of bucks can do wonders sometimes. It was quite a layout. 
Books, pictures, furniture, and whatnots that make living at home pretty agreeable. I propped myself up on a stool at Frank's little bar, poured myself a drink, and sat there waiting for him. I was like that a half an hour later when he showed up. He looked a little unsteady on his feet. Oh, gee whiz. Johnny Dollar. Hi. This is the last person in the world I expect to see. I'm glad to like and let you in. I didn't think you'd mind. No, not at all. I tried to phone you earlier tonight. You were out. I'm sorry. Chief Whiz. What's on your mind, Johnny? I wanted to tell you I was shot at tonight. What? I wanted to tell you I found out who Mrs. McCormick is and was. Since you were on the case first for Allied, I thought I'd tell you first. Well, gee whiz. Say, this is a nice setup. Full of nice things. Yeah. I've been in places like this before, Frank. They usually start at 300 or better a month. Good maid service, phone service. All those things cost money. A lot of money. Don't they, Frank? Gee whiz. When'd you tumble to it, Johnny? A little while ago, when I was out on Long Island, Julian McCormick made me a proposition. He finally offered me $100,000. A lot of money. He sounded like he'd had experience making propositions. I should have tumbled to it a couple of days ago when you phoned the parole office after I left you. You used my name when you asked for Joe Panny's address. Yes. I wondered if your tip was on the right track. I didn't figure Joe Panny was eligible for parole so quick. I had to get to him before you did. He wasn't the kind to keep his mouth shut. You shut it for him, didn't you, Frank? Mind if I sit down, Johnny? Now, go ahead. They'll be strapping you down one of these days. <laughs> Gee whiz. No hundred and a half a week investigating claims by nice places like this. It was one of those lucky things, Johnny. When I was called to Long Island to investigate that heist five years ago, I met McCormick's wife. Happened to recognize her as Joe Panny's ex. And you knew McCormick was in love with his wife enough to pay you to keep quiet. I gave him service for his money. The cops would have broken that case in 24 hours, but I covered up all the tracks I could find. And I made it real safe by seeing Joe sent up the river. How? <laughs> Just tipped off the cops to some of his hot car deals, and they picked him up. He happened to be carrying a gun, so he got to works. Then you just sat around drawing blackmail from McCormick. Gee whiz. Don't look at me like that, Johnny. Every guy has his price. How about you? <laughs> That's the second offer I've had tonight. It's a good one. Joe Panny was a dumb guy. He picked up that jewelry and went right downtown and plunked it in a safe deposit box. He's been sitting there all the time he was up the river. Still worth... Sorry, quite... Frank. You sure? I'm sure. Chief Whist. Chief Whist, Johnny, you are a good dick. You don't buy off. I just wanted to see, I guess. Sure, Frank. Well, do we go in quietly? <laughs> You'd be surprised, Johnny, how quiet. You better dial for an ambulance if you want me to go to the trial. What? You, you were good in that alley back of the theater tonight, Johnny, when I tried to knock you off. I... I followed you all night looking for my chance. You, you nicked me twice. Dial a doc. Quick, quick. Gee, whiz, it hurts. He died right there, without saying another word. The disposition of the case and what to do about Frank Porter, an insurance adjuster who goes bad, is a matter I don't have to handle. And I'm glad. Expense account item 14, hotel and board in New York City, $79.30. Item 15, $84, legal fees and incidental expenses involved in locating the widow of Mike Cairns, who it seems is still alive somewhere in Iowa and will accept half the reward as promised. Item 16, $14 even, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $265.91. Remarks, gee whiz. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about next week's story. Thanks. Next week, the story of a ship, the Molly Kay. Destination... 
Davy Jones' locker. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Virginia Gregg, Marvin Miller, Forrest Lewis, Frank Gerstel, Herb Butterfield, Herb Ellis, Tony Barrett, Ken Christie, Jack Crucian, and Junius Matthews. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. This was a very solid first serial. In many ways, the job of this serial is to hook listeners and get them to keep coming back. And I think that this was very effective in that regard. First of all, it does a good job of introducing this particular take on Johnny Dollar. Now, not everyone listening in 1955 was uh, an original listener. There was a pretty big decline in mysteries on the radio. So, doubtless some folks who had been listening to something else were tuning in to Johnny Dollar, and they got to hear the way that Bob Bailey was portrayed, and they got a good introduction to the character. He's tough, he's smart, he's tenacious, but he is human, and occasionally, or uh, quite often sometimes, jumps to the wrong conclusion, as he did in episode 5. I also think that the serial was helped by all of the characters that were used. The five-part storyline was really used quite effectively to really create an in-depth and engaging story to give it space to breathe. And having all of these different characters appear, I think, makes it feel almost uh, cinematic. Because you weren't getting this many characters typically like in a television show. And certainly in most mystery serials I've heard, you didn't have the same breadth of stories. So you kind of get a feel for what you're going to get in this series. And I think that the conclusion was very well done and memorable. And for my part, I found that this is one I don't forget who did it. Or I should say that I pick up the solution and remember pretty quickly. Uh, as soon as Frank said, gee whiz, I knew in the words of Monk that that's the guy. I think it was definitely a surprise the first time around. There were things that pointed to Frank Porter, in particular the call to the parole board, that could clue an astute observer in, but could also easily go over a listener's head. The story definitely has a very noirish feel to it, without feeling like it's a throwback to the late 40s or earlier in the 1950s. It really projected a fresh feel and served as a great launching pad for uh, Bob Bailey in this uh, big national role for him. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Leslie, Patreon supporter since uh, November of 2018, currently supporting the show at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Leslie. And that will do it for today. A reminder, you can be sure to never miss an episode by following the podcast with your favorite podcast software. 
And if you are enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But join us back here tomorrow for Tales of the Texas Rangers, where... Pretty much of a mess, ain't it, Jace? Uh-huh. Mrs. West was lucky, though. I've seen gas heater explosions when there wasn't a thing left of the house. What do you make of it? You figure somebody could have come in here and turned the gas on like Amy says? It could be. Yeah, heater valve was open. Yeah, but Amy could have left it open herself. You know how careless people are about things like that. Uh-huh. You say Mrs. West thinks somebody tried to kill her a couple of times before. That's right. But, Jace, to tell the truth, I don't put much stock in what she's been saying. Why not? Well, Amy's always been kind of... High strung, get yourself all upset about little things. You know how women are sometimes. Is she happy with her husband? Oh, Mark's always been real good to her. Seems to be crazy about Amy and her about him. Only one thing wrong I ever knew of. What's that? Well, both of them's always wanted kids and they never had any. Last five, six years, Amy's been kind of brooding about it. What about these other times she said attempts had been made on her life? Well, the first time it was the brakes on her car. They went out and Amy smacked into a fence. She was lucky, just shook her up some. Mechanic said it could happen to any car. And the second time? She phoned me and said there was a prowler downstairs. When I got here, she swore she could still hear him walking around. I looked everywhere, and I didn't find a sign of anybody. Where was her husband? Away. He'd gone up to Dallas early that evening. You reckon he's involved in this? Oh, I don't think so. Jace, like I say, he's pretty fond of her. As far as you know, Sheriff, did Mrs. West ever try to take her own life? Well... Just between us, the way Amy's been acting lately, I wouldn't put it past her. Uh Uh-huh. We better go down and have a talk with both of them. If Amy does have ideas about suicide, Jace, how come all this talk about somebody trying to kill her? The human mind's a funny thing. Sometimes that's the way it works. You mean she could have done all these things herself, and yet she really believes somebody else has been doing them? Something like that. And I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box 13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.